All right, back to politics now. Back in 1986, it was then Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev who opened his Communist Party's Congress with this quote, without glasnost, there is not and there cannot be democratism. The political creativity of the masses and their participation in management. Partly defined as being transparent in the dissemination of information, the term glasnost marked a shift for Russia toward its future and toward the rest of the world. Now, our next guest argues in a piece in New York Magazine that progressive America needs its own glasnost and to speak out against the madness. The author of that piece, Jonathan Chait, joins us now. Good to have you on. Jonathan, explain, if you will. Thank you. Yeah, I was um, kind of commenting off of some reporting that Eric Wemple did for the Washington Post. He went back and looked at what happened um, at the New York Times in July of 2020 when there was a furor over the Tom Cotton op-ed. I think your viewers are familiar with this episode. Right. What I thought was interesting is that Eric Wemple admitted he didn't um, straightforwardly say what he thought was happening at the time because he was afraid for his job. And that really tracked with a lot of what I was hearing from people I know in journalism and other fields, that they were afraid to say what they honestly thought was happening within their own institutions. So the conclusion I drew from this is that a lot of these institutions did some pretty crazy things, and we need some reckoning, some openness with what actually happened so that we can correct some of the errors that were done, figure out why these mistakes were made, and, 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 and go forward in a more open way. So I, 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 saw, I thought the gloss-nosed comparison was kind of was fun. I'm not saying that this was a Soviet system that was in place, but there's just sort of a, a, a fun historical comparison. Jonathan, I hear a lot in focus groups from Trump supporters that he liberated them to be able to tell it like it is and to say things that weren't to be said. What comparison yeah. is there with that here? And I know that sounds strange, I would say but it is almost, you know, there, uh, there's policing speech for the purposes of social graces, and then there's policing speech because it's yeah. offensive. Yeah, I would say there's almost no comparison between those two things. I don't think Trump compare, Trump supporters, for the most part, were ever prevented from saying what they think, and especially in these conservative spaces on, you know, Donald Trump says completely racist things all the time. Um, and in, you know, the, the biggest host of, of on Fox News is a, is a white nationalist. So, you know, they're repurposing a, a liberal critique of the left to justify their own um, racist inclinations. And I think the the task for liberals is to disassociate ourselves from that while also looking at what's happening within progressive spaces and saying we need liberal values. Well, and, and, and let's uh, let's just uh, let's be very specific here and let me offend a lot of people yeah. because that's know. what I do. We only have a few um, more minutes left. I let's, can't let's tell you do a show without how many someone. progressives or how many liberals will say things privately or quietly. Let's take the the pen swimmer that transitioned and they said now do you really do you really I just I, I don't think I don't think young women should have to compete against somebody who transitioned you know after puberty and it's just not fair and I said well why don't you write a column about oh I can't write a column about that I go well but you believe and so I found a pew poll where 82 percent of Americans 82 percent of Americans don't believe that men who transition uh, post puberty should be able to compete against women in sports 82 percent and yet if you have that conversation on television in news if you write an op-ed about it suddenly you hate and you're a hater and so we just don't have the conversation um despite the fact that the international sports association i think came to the same conclusion that 82% of Americans made. Now, I'm not saying that because 82% of Americans think it that it's right or that it's wrong, but I suggest that maybe we ought to be able to have that debate on television without people being scared for their jobs. And I'm not saying that people would lose their jobs. See what I have to do here? I'm just saying we have to be able to debate issues like this and other issues that might make us uncomfortable. 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, and look, there there've always been some limits on what people feel like they can say in polite society for for good reason. You don't want people saying things like Tucker Carlson says um, on MSNBC and CNN. You don't have white nationalists on your program, and I think that's the correct decision. But I think in a lot of these institutions, people really are afraid, as Wemple admitted, to say relatively moderate things, reasonable criticisms, and I think that can create a, an unhealthy atmosphere where the people who have the most fanatical or extreme ideas can sort of buffalo everyone else into into going along with, with their position. So I think, yeah. you know, you, you need to strike a healthy balance, and I think what Wemple was admitting is that we don't have healthy balance in a lot of these places. Right, and, and, and Eric, Eric was basically said he was afraid to write that column for two and a half years. Mm. And a lot of other people right. were afraid to write that column for two and a half years, too. Write it for the New York Magazine, for New York Magazine. Thank Jonathan Shade, as always, thank you so much. So.